ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Digital Grocer episode 41. It's actually season four, episode five, but I just kind of like just incrementing that number. And your host, Sylvain Perry, president and CEO of Mercatus Technologies. It's actually great. It's been such a long time since uh, we've had the opportunity to record. And joining me here from the safety of his warm, cozy, dank basement is, is Mercatus' VP of Marketing, Mark Fairs. Mark, welcome to the show. Great to be back. Happy to be here. Hey, Mark, what's what's going on back there? It looks like, uh, like you should be having a little scotch or a little Bailey's or something. Well, that that's just off camera. So you've got uh, you got the festive side. Yeah. And then you got the anti dank uh, fireplace. Yeah. The yeah. Version. <laughs> it's, uh, I think it's I think it's great. I mean, it's it's very apropos considering the snowstorm that we just had. Yeah. Yeah. Or, well, I, I, it's not much accumulation here. Uh, but I'm pretty sure you got uh, you got a little more than I did. I absolutely, we definitely did get a little bit more snow um, that you likely got because you're in the east end of the. Uh... Yeah, and I'm pretty. For those of you who don't know the Toronto area, east end pretty close to the lake, so it's yeah. um, it's moderated by the, the large body of water that surrounds us. Lake Ontario. That's right. Which is great. I'm north of the city, so about 32 miles uh, north of the city in suburbia. Uh, and it is, we're not on lockdown here. Uh, obviously, I think the, the city in itself is and some you know some other low-lying areas around the city. So it's a complete, completely different uh, feel up here. But we uh, certainly feels like it considering the snowstorm that we just got. In any case, we got a action-packed show. Lots to discuss about. Mark, I want to talk about um, Metro out of Montreal. They just made a really big announcement a week ago, and yeah. they are spending. I mean, they've seen they've seen uh, a tremendous increase in their online sales. They've actually gone ahead, and I, I think a lot of this. I, I'm not sure if this is in response not just to the pandemic, but likely the fact that uh, Sobeys with their Voila service is going to be uh, servicing. Um, the Montreal area uh, with um, their partnership with Ocado, but Metro has decided to build out a dark store. It's going to cost them roughly about 15 million Canadian uh, to build this out. 15 million Canadian, you know, lop off 30%. That gives you a sense of what that costs in U.S. dollars. But they're they're going all in, and it, I, Metro, you know, I don't shop at Metro. I, they they've never they've never, in in my opinion, in the Canadian landscape been i wouldn't say not necessarily at the forefront of 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 anything but they are slowly starting to ramp up and they're actually making some important strides with it, which i think is great yeah yeah i mean i'm, I'm fortunate to have uh, one of their stores within like a five minute walk uh, mm. from where i am but it, but it is not set up for e-commerce uh, even though they've got uh you know a sign in their window saying you know click and collect or for you know, the american audience curbside is available. Mm -hmm. It's just not. It's just not built out that way. But my guess is in Quebec, where they're probably a little more uh, downfield when it comes yeah. to enabling e-commerce, uh, they are. Uh, they're learning lessons. And it, what's interesting is, you know, I don't know if you've heard. I'm not sure who, if anyone is helping them build this out. Um, but they seem to be taking it mostly in house. And uh, and as you said, you know, I think the you know the re the recent uh, uptick, huge swing in in online orders, interest in online purchasing that we've seen right. in the U.S. Same things happening here. They're 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 doubling down on um, enabling that capability in those dense urban centers. Yeah, it's I, I've always had this impression that you, it, you know this this is the reality of doing business in Canada. You know, not that this shows anything about politics, but if you're going to do business in Montreal. You have to have an office in Montreal, or if you're going to do business in the province of Quebec, you have to have an, off, an office in the province, preferably Montreal. Quite frankly, you also have to have a French-speaking uh, CEO that's Quebecois, which I, I qualify for, uh, but we don't, we don't do business. And in my, in my sense was that Metro was always uh, somehow involved with Orchestra out of Montreal, which does you know predominantly e-commerce on uh, more in the uh, the the it's hard good, soft good side. So right. But, competition with Kibo. So not sure, I'm not sure who's leading the charge for, for Metro, but and best of luck to them. And, and it's great to see a Canadian retailer uh, do well in this space. Now, speaking of Canadian retailers, we know that Loblaws announced their Q3 numbers not long ago. 
And then on the e-commerce side, they've hit a gain of 175%, which I yeah. think is just astounding. Um, did you see the news that they're going to be testing autonomous vehicles? Yeah, I did. I, to be honest, I'd never heard of the, the company they're going to be using. It's called Gaddick. Yeah, Gaddick AI out of, um, out of California. Now, was it last year or the year before um, we did a piece in the Canadian Grocer magazine and we kind of really discussed about, hey, what's the chances that we're going to see some form of autonomous vehicle roaming the streets of Toronto? And I swore up and down, oh, it'll never happen. It will never happen. Um, and I said that with, with the sense that I qualified it by, I don't think our municipal governments or provincial governments will have um, the cojones to kind of step up and you know yeah. regulate this somehow. Yeah, and, I know. Right? Yeah, and I, I recall the, the conversation. It's because um, I think it was when Loblaws announced that they were going to lease um, Tesla trucks for right. supply chain. Right. Yeah. Well, so there's some stuff happening in the industry. So, um, you know, we've managed to kick the can down the road in terms of green energy. But in any case, some of the some of the more bullish provinces in the country here, Quebec being one of them, uh, and this is surprising. So I'm not sure where our province sits. But Quebec has said that by 2030, or it could be 2035, they will only allow 5%, excluding commercial vehicles, they will only allow 5% of vehicles, uh, new vehicles sold to be fossil fuel based. So wow. the expectation is going to be full on, full on electric. So now you're seeing some strong investments from Ford, GM, and Chrysler and you know Tesla and also and, and so on and not just in the US landscape but in the Kenyan landscape to come out with some you know better green energy vehicles. I think that's going to open up the door for some really interesting innovations on the AI side for autonomous vehicles. Now what they're doing is these are not full, fully autonomous vehicles. It's actually five retrofitted Ford 350 Transit vans. Gotcha. That will okay. that will have a uh, pilot, um, a human being. It's a human co-driver. Yeah, human co-driver, -dri yeah. which, which I think is is great. And, and I'm sure that Loblaw, is much like any other company here in, in the Canadian market, is taking advantage of some sort of government tax credit. Yeah, to try this out, right? Anyways. These, these trucks are going to be on prescribed routes continuously for a period of 12 months. They're going to see what's going to happen, and you know, hopefully they're going to expand uh, out from there. Mark, did you yeah. hear what, ha what happened with that um, electric truck manufacturer yesterday? Is it Nikola? I can't remember the name of who these guys yeah, are. Yeah, no, you're right. I think it was GM. GM had a deal to either co-build. Yeah. Um, Trucks. Yeah, you're right. I think the company is called Nikola. Yeah. Uh, uh, Nikola Tesla. Tesla. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, I, so, I wonder sorry. if he's got any descendants who can claim some copyright infringement on family name. Well, we would know about copyright infringements. That's, that's true. <laughs> but in any case, um, I want to talk about Kroger. I mean, they announced their their tenth CFC along with Okada, which is a big investment, two hundred thousand square feet. It's going to cost them in the millions of dollars. I don't think it's as big as what Sobeys invested in their three hundred fifty thousand square foot facility here in Bonn, uh, Ontario. But it's it's the tenth one for uh, for Kroger in partnership with Okado. Uh, the really interesting part here is the first CFC is going to be opening up in 2021 in the Ohio market. I think it's going to be a really strong cutting edge um, for Kroger being able to do this and servicing, you know, trying to service e-commerce profitably. Now, they're also going to be leveraging from the folks over at Ocado MFC technology, as well right. as some, some sort of in-store click and collect fulfillment uh, solution. Okay. Yeah, we had talked about this. Ocado had made, uh, I think, investments in at least two two software companies recently right. that were focused on automating the in-store um, curbside pickup uh, experience. Yeah, well, they continue they continue to build out their IP portfolio, which, quite frankly, in this day and age, makes sense. I mean, if you were around in the tech space in the '90s and in the early 2000s, I mean, if you lived through, you know, Apple, Nortel. BlackBerry, 
uh, and the list goes on in some of the memory chip manufacturers. And it was all about amassing this war chest of intellectual property. And then, and, and again, when we talked about this in a previous show, it was really about using it as a sword and a shield to go out and enforce your rights as an IP owner, and as well as use it as a defensive play. Yeah. Yeah. But, and this IP has a shelf life. Quite frankly, so if you're not using it in, in, in any way that's material, a material benefit to you, why do you have it? Now, I think there was an announcement not long ago that BlackBerry is actually looking to sell quite a bit of its intellectual property. But oh, be, yeah, it's yeah, absolutely. Anyways, we're not, it's not a telecom show, but in any, in any case, it's <laughs> digital growth. It can all turn into one. It, well, they can go anywhere in these days. Uh, our friends over at DoorDash, their IPO, it is imminent. Yeah. So yeah. very exciting. Yeah, I think theirs and Airbnb are the ones that um, everyone's keeping an eye out for. Yeah, and the, and the challenge now is are, are the Canadian government announced yesterday um, so a so-called digital tax, uh, which will have an impact on Airbnb on the properties that are being rented out in uh, in the Canadian market. So, and stay tuned on that. Not sure how could this materially impact the the IPO in terms of its valuation. I doubt it. Um, I'm sure Canada is just a blip in, in the world of uh, Airbnb. But anyways, DoorDash, their, their IPO is eminent. Uh, they're offering 33 million Class A uh, shares, common A shares, which is going to be really cool. You know, share price, speculation between 75 to 85 dollars um probably the, the total ipo will be between 2.4 2.5 billion to maybe higher we're not not entirely sure i think what they've done and correct me if i'm wrong i mean they're basically taking the concept of last mile delivery and really commoditizing it extremely quick yeah yeah and i think i think they're under the gun too i think um I think the uh, the pandemic and the online ordering uh, and home delivery has really accelerated uh, a lot of the revenue that they're seeing. And uh, as much as everybody wants uh, wants to get the vaccine and have it distributed, I think it will also have an impact on these companies that uh, have done well as a result mm -hmm. of the pandemic. Yeah, absolutely. And. Uh, before we kind of, you know, bring in our guests and start talking about it, we just we just wrapped up. Well, we didn't, but our friends in, in the U.S. just wrapped up Thanksgiving. Yeah. Very different Thanksgiving, obviously because of, of COVID nineteen and so on. Uh, but in some markets, um, Thanksgiving may have been without a turkey. And did you did you hear about this story, Mark? No, not until you put it in the show notes. No, okay, so you didn't you didn't hear no. Yeah, sure, I'd I'd, I'd love to. So, on the um, the week prior to Thanksgiving, right? Because today we're we're on Tuesday, December first. We're recording the show. It should be released uh, in the next forty eight hours. And so the uh, not last Wednesday, the Wednesday prior, I get a, a panic text message and a phone call from from a client in uh, Texas and it turns out that you know and her, her request was hey we, we really need your help we need to we um, we're about to delist a, um, a turkeys for sale online in all of our banners and just, just before the holiday just before the holiday and I'm like is it, this is odd. Like, no, we've seen cases where turkeys are being delivered to the store and the refrigeration truck is broken and the truck driver doesn't know and the turkeys are rotted in the back and, you know, so on and so on. And in, and in this case here, she goes, no, 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 this is a, this is a problem for us. Uh, we need to be listed. I said, you can do that. That's very easy to do in our technology. She goes, I also need, need your help in um, emailing all the customers that have pre-bought turkeys and letting them know we can't fulfill the orders. So, okay, but what happened? She goes, well, unfortunately, the plant uh, outside of Tyler, Texas, blew up and killed 82, 85,000 oh, turkeys. Are you serious? No, I'm very serious. And I'm like, I, she's telling me this. I'm like, this is, there's no way this happened. How does this happen in today's modern day? Sure enough, I have to bring up the website and I'm looking at this. And yeah, absolutely. You know, there was a fire gas leak something had blew up yeah 
That's crazy. Crazy. Anyways, that's not, I figured I'd share that with people that there can be disruptions to the supply chain that's <laughs> not related, right, not related yeah. to the pandemic. It could be something completely different. And it's, it's a great example of a retailer having to quickly respond. Yeah, absolutely. So the one thing that we do on Digital Grocer, um, you know, Mark and I don't necessarily pick our subject matter as being, you know, just pie in the sky and, you know, let's just get on the mic on the mics here and the camera and just talk and throw a show out there. It's really about educating the masses. And so the one thing that we do is we consume a lot of media. We consume media and content. You know, some of our sources can be conversations with the analysts at Forrester, uh, some of the senior analysts over at Gartner. Obviously, we maintain relationships with a lot of research houses um, as of late, Incisive, uh, as well as Brick Meets Click. And we've had um, people from both of those firms on our on our shows. And, and, and it's a way for us to, to, you know, we're lifelong learners, both Mark and I. So it enables us to kind of kind of make sure that the, what we're presenting to our clients and our prospects and you know our audience in general is extremely factual. Um, and if we don't know, we'll be the first to say we don't know, but we'll also kind of like to point point say, hey, I think you should call so-and-so because they'll be able to help you out. And part of that, it's not just spending time with those individuals, but it's also consuming and writing content. And when you find in a position where you're able to write content and people are you know, genuinely interested in reading that, it's a great way to, to force you to kind of be better. And we read so, you know, we've, we've had um, multiple authors on this show and one of them that kind of crept up in a, in a series of conversations with some analysts and uh, just, just from scouring the uh, amazon.com or .ca, uh, it is uh, a propos here in, in Canada. Uh, one of the books that came up on Mark's radar and Mark's like, hey, you got to get this book, we got to read it. Um, it's what's, uh, the title of the book is The Secret Life of groceries and I'm just holding this up for the camera here uh, and it's written by a gentleman by the name of Benjamin Moore and this book is I'll never give it justice in terms of summarizing it but for me it is tackling a series of subjects that are almost taboo in the industry that we won't talk and I've been in retail technology for 25 years now from banking to apparel to re to research working at a research house and to Mercatus doing e-commerce and in-store technology and just a bunch of stuff. There's stuff that we won't talk about. We won't talk about trade dollars and how some retailers live and die by trade dollars. And if they weren't getting them from the CPGs, they wouldn't be able to make ends meet. And, and I can tell you a story being at one of the East Coast's largest retailers in the in the office of the CMO, and a VP category jumping in and screaming, not thinking I was an employee, saying, I can't believe this media company's coming in here. They're going to erode our trade dollars. We're not going to be able to make, I'm not going to be able to make my quarter numbers, but my bonus, blah, blah, blah. And then CMO says, oh, have you met Sly? He, he doesn't work here. He's, he's not an employee. He's a vendor. And, and you start to find out about these things. And this book tackles these elements and, and because it, is, it does shape the way we consume and then we, we look at, we don't look at food anymore and essentially we'll look at product. So joining us today to talk about his book is the author himself, Benjamin Lohr. And for, the, for those of you who don't know him, uh, he's not only the author of The Secret Life of Groceries, he's also wrote um, a book called Hellbent. It's a critical exploration of the, I'm going to botch this here, Bikram Yoga community that first uh, detailed patterns of abuse and sexual misconduct by its guru. And I think there was uh, a, I don't want to say Netflix or, or Prime TV special on this, but it was riveting. When I, my wife, actually, when I told, told her I was reading Benjamin's book, she's like, you got to go watch da -da 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 this. And when we watched a bit of it, it's great. Um, he's a graduate of Montgomery County Public School and Columbia University. He lives in New York. Benjamin, uh, I want to welcome you to uh, Digital Grocer. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Exciting to be here uh, and listen to you guys cool. talk shop. <laughs> awesome. Uh, so I, I, you know, like I said, you know, when I was introducing you, your your book explores 
these these dark areas of the grocery retail industry that are that are not you know you you don't talk to people about this at trade shows or when I'm at clients' offices or meetings. I, I want to know what compelled you to write this book. Yeah, well, I came in as an outsider. I just love grocery stores. I think I, <laughs> you guys are maybe so far in the industry that that. Uh, I have this childlike fascination with them from for I, when I go on trips to other countries, I'll uh, just choose to schmooze around a grocery store <laughs> in Paris or, or Tokyo or Nairobi. And, and uh, they've always been this place that occupies a unique place in my brain. It's it's a surreal quality to them, the amount of abundance and choice and all the items on the shelves and all their colors kind of blaring out at you that is both soothing and I actually get relaxed just walking down those like waxed floors <laughs> of the grocery store, but also powerful. There's like a real intensity to these places and they've always had this kind of hallucinogenic surreal quality and I just wanted to scratch the surface and, and like what makes them tick because my experience was entirely consumer facing. Um, and so, yeah, I, I thought this will be a fa fascinating world to get into. And, and it was connected in my mind to the Bikram world, which was its own, you know, subculture. And I thought by drilling into a specific supermarket chain, I could understand some of the reasons why we buy things in the same way that I could understand like the phenomenon of yoga by exploring the Bikram yoga community. Yeah, it's, it, you know, when you spend, you know, you spend time in, in grocery. Now, I've never achieved that level of taking every Friday off and touring grocery stores like some of our clients do because that's that's operations guys. That's what they like to do. That's how they know things are working and not working and, and connecting. But there, it's true. And if you go, I remember visiting um, grocery stores in Malaysia when I was working in south, southeast um, of part of that part of the country, and it's just. There's something innately fascinating on how the whole aspect of food and product gets to a shelf and what happens in the back. Now, your yeah, book I think it's just outrageous. I mean, it's like, it, and I mean outrageous in a good sense. It's this thing that has never existed in the human imagine. You know, you put a caveman in a grocery store and they lose their mind because. <laughs> so incredible what's being offered there. And the subtitle of the book is this dark miracle because I think yeah. it is the living miracle that people take for granted. Uh, COVID has definitely done a lot of the work that I was trying to do in this book for me in that it's, it's really ripped, uh, it, it, it pushed the grocery store to the forefront and, and people saw it as this essential link in their lives and, and even started, you know, simplifying their purchases when the supply chain started to like flicker maybe slightly. Uh, and realized how much they had been taking for granted um, the the choice prior to that. Right. But, uh, I, I don't know. It, it, to me, it's just this outrageous, surreal thing that that doesn't even make sense that we would be deserving of this abundance. <laughs> now, when you when you wrote this book, I mean, your interviews are spot on. You're going deep. It's not superficial. Not only are you type, you know, tapping into the subject matter, what you're trying to tease out of these people you're spending time with. I mean, God's sakes, you got into an 18 wheeler to go deliver a, a load of food to an Aldi uh, distribution center um, and so on. I mean, you traveled the world for this. What, what was that one thing in, in all these interviews that just hit you? You're like, oh, crap. Yeah, well, there were a lot of moments like that. So, uh, yes, as as you, you know from reading the book, but people listening might not know, I specialize in kind of like immersion journalism where I'm really like putting myself into places. Uh, so for the Bikram book, I did a lot of yoga um, and, and may not need to do much yoga again for a long time. Uh, and for this book, I, you know, I traveled around with truckers. I broke into factory farms with activists. I tried to shadow people on their rounds as they did certification or followed uh, brokers and uh, work. I got a job at a Whole Foods at a fish counter and, you know, went overseas to Thailand to the bottom of the seafood chain. A lot of moments where I was like, oh, my God. And I guess I could go into the, the like, 
there, like I could answer the question by giving like the most crazy anecdote, but I I came away with because I'm an outsider. Mm. I guess I came up with these two ideas. One was just how focused the whole industry, especially the store level, is on serving consumers, which I think fucked the narrative in my brain that I went into the book with, which was okay. There's this critique of food that there are these greedy multinational corporations that are kind of uh, you know profit driven to the ex to, uh, to the extent that they uh, are willing to like sacrifice quality and we're kind of at their mercy and that just wasn't the case on the store level where these where there's so much competition between stores uh, and everyone was just focused, hyper focused on service to the consumer and that you know that big takeaway uh as well as the the flip side to that which was just how secretive the industry is and right. i think most people don't have a good sense of this because it's like grocery stores it's so banal it's so boring why would it be a top secret industry but when the margins are so so low uh, and trade secrets are so real you get people who are really phobic about talking about their industry and it, it results in some a place where bad things are hidden and there are legitimate bad things in this right. book that I'm into, but good things are hidden. And I, I left the book convinced that most of the people in the grocery world were working really hard to give consumers food in a manner that was ethical and dignified and allowed them to survive their competition. But getting them to talk about that and documenting it on the book was extremely difficult because nobody wanted to talk about anything. Yeah, I can, I can relate to that. I mean, Mark and I have, have given lectures where it'll be very, very much a room of 50, 60 people and it's open and it's transparent because you have some regional retailers that don't compete. But in the moment they spot someone that comes in from Walmart, no one wants to talk anymore. And yeah. the dynamics, the dynamics change. I've also heard stories of some retailers breaking into stores that are in the middle of construction just to steal or take pictures of the blueprints. I mean, it, it's just... Okay. It, it's ridiculous. It doesn't surprise me at all. I mean, I spoke to consultants. I mean, sure, you guys know all of this, so it feels silly. But, like, I was blown away with talking to these consultants who would do single blind consultancies where mm. they weren't told about the product that they were consulting, the name of the product they were on. They were just in facts because the company that was hiring them to give them advice about their product was too scared that they would then take some of those details and share it with another client down the line. I, I, mean, I, I, just, I, I used to work as a consultant and like that level of secrecy just doesn't, hmm. didn't compute to me. Like now <laughs> you're in, inhibiting me from even doing my job to the, that you're hiring me for. Um, so yeah, that's that, that really, that's crazy. Now in the later part of the book, you, you make a comparison to your first book and how the more human and uh, the votes themselves to the practice of yoga, right? They can become more capable humans. So the more they do it, they become way better. And it, you know, and you're at some point you said it feels eerily similar with everyone bending on both knees for the God of convenience and efficiency. Then you go on to write when you make convenience itself an end point, what then? Now, did you ever answer that question? Yeah, I don't. That, so that's a, this is a, it's a core part of the book. And, uh, and it really gets at like, I think anyone who looks at the grocery industry for even half a moment sees how much energy is going into making things convenient and efficient. Mm. And it is this overriding demand that has ripple effects all throughout the chain. Uh, a lot of the, the most negative consequences that I came around up to like totally exploited labor and if you read the book it this includes like yeah. actual human bondage but it also includes just people living with very undignified lives because they don't have the money to to do that but it's all driven by an incentivized system where the people there's no real bad actors people who are evil and cackling at these things they're they're working so hard to get an edge uh in their own niche that that these are these are ripple effects off of it um so that driver convenience is is so important and i guess that question of like what do you what happens when you make convenience an endpoint is not something that's an industry facing question it's a consumer facing question i think it's it's like a crisis almost like a, a civilization level crisis of like we have this giant gaping cultural wound of 
meaning. Like where, what are we doing with all the time we're saving bettering our lives? Like, and what does it even mean to better our lives anymore? I, I think the grocery store just happens to be a focal point where this question shows up in fruits. Um, and I guess it was something I became really fascinated in because I spent a, a bunch of time in the book trying to understand why people buy things. Um, and, you know, I was speaking to people in PR and branding and retail mm -hmm. architects. And I kind of came back to this idea that the anthropologist Grant McCracken came up with, which is that material goods provide a bridge to meaning and not just any type of meaning, but when you buy something, you're trying to reach for what he would call a displaced ideal. And a displaced ideal is something that's extremely important to how you manifest your life and how you're expressing yourself, but something that doesn't quite stand up to, to every day. Like you don't live it out every day. That's why it's an ideal. And because it's so important to you, but not part of your every day, you, 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 you put it out of reach into it's to an object or maybe a hero, something that allows the ideal to live on uh, without having to be, you know, subject to the disappointments of reality. Right. So right. This theory of why people are buying things in general. And I guess writ large, it just seems like our choices are saying the biggest displaced ideal we're searching for these days is convenience. This ideal of, uh, which, which is never intended as an endpoint. Convenience is a, means to an end. Convenience, you, you, you make things convenient and efficient so you can then go on and do what? And it, it seems like we've lost that what. Right. And it, it shows up in the, in the grocery supply chain. It shows up in a lot of different areas of life. Um, but grocery in particular pays a price for that, I guess, because, it, because it's so oriented around convenience. Um, and, and yeah. I, yeah, I don't know. To answer your question, I don't answer. I, I don't give a good answer to that. I, I just note that it's driving a lot of really bad things, and it would be helpful if we thought about the problem in those terms. Yeah, no, well said. I mean, yeah, no, I, I think that's fascinating from the perspective, and Sylvan and I see this all the time. Uh, you know, how much convenience is enough? You know, Amazon's built Prime uh, on the basis of convenience, and you can see this sort of. Um, this uh, brinksmanship when it comes to uh, between Walmart and Amazon, get it in two hours, get it in one hour, get it in 30 minutes. Yeah. So you're, to your point, uh, how fast is fast enough? And, and so in all your journeys going through this, did e-commerce ever come up in some of your research or what you're seeing happening with Walmart and Amazon? Sure. Uh, you know, I didn't focus on e-commerce somewhat intentionally and in many ways i feel like i wrote the secret life of groceries up until 2015 <laughs> you know or like it, you know that that is a momentous shift in the industry that deserves an entire book of its own and i recognized that while i was writing it. it was kind of like a conscious decision that i was like oh i could write 50 pages on this and it would take another like six months of research or or i can just like ignore it <laughs> and and, and that ignores the wrong word but but I, I did speak to a lot of people about uh, these shifts. Um, mm -hmm. I, I guess it's, I mean, is there like a specific question on that or just like e-commerce? Like, I just, guess it's like here today. Just, no, no, no specific questions, just a general question. Yeah, I guess one of the things I think about with it is um, how, you, how stores are going to be transferring the in-store experience to the online platform in a way, especially that caters to the younger non-list shoppers. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like youngsters don't go and shop with lists anymore. There's this, this very associative process of going to the store and planning your meal by looking at things and being inspired and building it up as you go. You know, maybe you're shopping three days a week, four days a week. Um, and... I, that's more and more common, and that experience doesn't seem like it lends itself to the current models of e-commerce very well, which are awesome at, for listed shoppers. You just like click down your list and you buy your things and you stock up. Um, so I think how 
e-commerce platforms on the front end manage to spark people's imagination and get them to think in that associative manner, whether that's plying them with different meal plans and, and you know, kind of bringing in some of this blue apron style energy of like uh, curating options. Uh, that strikes me as something that came up a couple times as, as, as a piece of the puzzle I haven't seen anyone conquer. It's like, we talked about, you talked about DoorDash in the beginning as commodifying the last mile, and I think that's like brilliant, but there's, there's a hurdle, like commodifying the last mile only matters if people have made up their minds about what they want that last mile to entail. So I don't know, there, there's something where it's like, Door, DoorDash is, not going to tell you what to buy. Right, uh, right. Shopping the way most young consumers are shopping. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's a that's a problem. That's yeah. a, that's something. It's an opportunity for people. Benjamin, it's been amazing having you on our show today. So, how do people get a hold of you if they want to reach out? Uh, you know, uh, Twitter, Facebook, uh, and uh, I got a website out there. The book is on Amazon. The leader in all things convenience. Perfect. Awesome. And Mark, how do people get a hold of us? Yeah, uh, go to digitalgrocer.com and uh, feel free to comment, su submit some uh, story ideas. We'd love to. We'd love to entertain them. Perfect. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been perfect today. It's beautiful outside, nice and uh, snowy. And uh, hopefully, you'll stay tuned. Download our next episode. Peace. <laughs>